welcome to The Seeing Eye. This is going to be a celebration of individuality in creativity. And, and honestly, uh, for the last couple of weeks, I've been thinking and thinking and thinking about this presentation. And I don't know, maybe it's creative procrastination, but I just could not figure out what I wanted to say. Um, so what do I say about the seeing eye? Yeah, I know it was my idea, but what do I say about it? And nothing came. And I asked again, and nothing came. And I asked again, and nothing came. So again, and again, and again, all I got was nothing, endlessly. And then I started doing that. Well, anything we can say to each other has already been said before. And then literally this morning, I realized that that's what I should share with you. The nothing, the void. So think about it. A script is nothing but an empty page until we fill it, right? The media card that's here in my computer is empty until we create something with it, until we put something into it. A film starts from a thought that comes to us from the void because it's that void where creativity lives. I mean, is my red your red? Is my blue your blue? Does it even matter if they're different? So we have to believe in the spirit of nothing, in the spirit of the void, because there lies our creative gifts. So if nothing is out there, why are we worried about it? Nobody but us can see what we see. Why should we let others judge us for what we create? Or um, there's nothing anyone can create or should judge except for what lies in that void. So think about it. Right there lies the birth of creativity. And I think about how many of us were told what to do and how to think and how to feel. And I grew up in the military. Um, my father was gone most of the time. He was a veteran of three wars. My mother was a rigid, rigid conservative, domineering, perfectionist, I'm getting really personal here, a talented, creative person trapped in the definition of woman, wife, mother in that 50s environment, right? I was told to calm down, to shush, don't speak too loudly, that children should be seen and not heard, and that my explorations of the preponderance of the small, little things that I would see on the road to, in my life, my observations were weird. And though I hated her when I was young, when I grew up, I loved her dearly. And I miss her. And I realized she was living in her own version of life and trying to help me by sharing it with me. And she didn't realize that I had my own life to live. And I, I'm sharing that with you because so many of us are told what to do and how to do it. I began photographing when I was very young because I didn't think I could paint. And I really, really wanted to paint. And my teachers would put my drawings up on the wall at school and praise them and give me gold stars. <laughs> But in my mind, like many of us, that creative work wasn't good enough. I wanted to paint. So I photographed and photographed and photographed. And then when I got, when I got older and I got in my teens, I spent many hours in a dark room. And I was creating something from nothing from those photographs. They had begun from nothing, but they came, you know, they became works of art, I thought, anyway. And I loved it. Um, then digital came along and it just felt it just it felt colder, more distant, less intimate, and I sold my dark room. But all these years I still miss that tangible. I miss the smell of fixer. I miss watching that magic happen and you know, developing those pictures in the in the red light of that dark room. I think I've adjusted and I use digital cameras now, of course, but I've got hundreds of thousands of pictures. I don't know if you guys do, but they're all buried on hard drives as digital files with metadata on them. And they're kind of like prisoners branded with numbers and shoved in a cell. And I'm still adjusting to that. I don't know what I'm gonna do and how I'm gonna see all of that. And then I think about the next generation, how are they gonna see all of that, right? So my happy place in the last few years has been sharing my photography with my friends. We would go out on Saturday mornings when I'm in town and we'd film for a couple of hours or shoot for a couple of hours. Then we'd come back and we'd process our photographs and, and then we would comment with each other about how different they were and how we all see the same thing. So it occurred to me that 
what I want to do is I want to show you these photographs from six photographers. They were all given the same assignment. And then these are the results that came out from that. So I hope you guys enjoy it. These are all my friends and uh, we had fun doing this. So I'm going to show you, uh, I'm going to share my presentation of their photography now. Okay, so let me go ahead and share and give me a moment to start. This is the part of it I don't like. Okay, we're going to play the slideshow for you guys. This is the seeing eye. It's a celebration of creative individuality. Um, first of all, I want to thank you, Maxim, and everybody, all these wonderful people who brought us together for the creativity convention. Um, you know, it was going to be in Iceland, and it ended up being virtual, but there's several of us who, are, who were in Iceland giving presentations, and I'm still going to go there in September. So here's the assignment. The assignment was shoot a picture that tells the story of the window. Six photographers, and you're going to see six completely different visions. Norman Schwartz is our friend. He used to own a, a Cessna. We were so lucky. We could go out on Saturday mornings early, and we would fly within two hours of of Los Angeles and land somewhere and then shoot and then come back and then we'd process them like I said and we would um, compare them but he's a photographer he's a retired corporate executive and he was a real estate attorney for many years but his love um, since his retirement uh, is his photography and this was the picture that he submitted um, this picture has such an emotional impact for me. This is Norman looking out of the window from his house. He had just lost his wife of 60 years and he was feeling lonely. So for him, the window was looking out on the world and thinking about what life was going to be like without his wife. And I think sharing that kind of intimate emotional moment is very important and I find it very beautiful. I don't know if that's a sunrise or a sunset. Oops. Sorry. Um, I lost my iPad, so please forgive me. <laughs> I may have to just replug it in. Hang on a second so I can see what's, what's happening. Sorry, you guys. It's plugged in, but it's telling me that it's out of power. So we're just going to have to keep going. It's no problem. Um, so anyway, Norman, for Norman, this was very, very personal. And these, uh, since, since he, uh, since he, um, lost his wife, let me go back to this one. This is what his pictures look like. Um, they, they, um, seem a little lonely to me. He's an amazing street photographer and these are all windows, but the people are, nondescript and they're moving through an almost surreal world so this is an example and this is why I wanted to talk to you guys about this today that I think when we're looking at something that we want to photograph we're not just showing the photograph we're showing who we are as creatives who we are as people and um, this is a perfect example perfect example of that right so thank you, Norman, for um, being so bold and sharing something that is so important to you. Um, this next uh, photographer is also a really good friend of mine. This is Louis Kravitz. Uh, Louis was a major corporate executive, and he's now retired, and he shoots every day. Oh, and by the way, going back to Norman, I should tell you, he shot those with a Nikon, and um, Norman... Uh, uses Nikon and we always tease him about it because we all had different cameras uh, at the time I was shooting on Sony Lewis was using as you can see here a Leica and then there was Norman on Nikon and we would have those conversations about okay and then bring Canon into it and we would talk about the gear but you know what it's not always about the gear it's about your eye and it's about what's in your heart and it's about what's in your brain and how you think about things so Lewis is somebody who loves the cities he has published a couple of books that he has shot in the busy busy uh cities in india and um he also loves people so he gets along really well with people so he goes into the city and he'll find moments where he can use um 
his his creativity to meet people and talk to other people. Yeah, and Ying Chu is just saying it's so sad that Nikon will not manufacture manufacture traditional cameras anymore. It is sad, but you know what? It um, it's fine. It's fine. We're always going to find ways of shooting things that are wonderful. When I was little, and I was using those little Instamatic cameras. You know, it's still fun, and I and I actually have some of those pictures still, and I can look back at, luckily, pictures of the Swiss Alps and and things like that, and it just it was wonderful, and it still is. So Lewis is here with his Leica, which he says is better than anything we will ever have, and <laughs> and we can argue about that till the cows come home. But I love his work, and Lewis was in New York City when I emailed my friends about this assignment, and so this is the picture that he took. And I love it. It's just uh, from the perspective of a construction window, this busy street in New York City. But I like the way uh, the woman is almost front and center, despite all that huge machinery all around her. So this perspective from Lewis is looking from his eye, his heart, into this busy street and seeing that woman and seeing the construction workers, but seeing everybody within that urban landscape and and how they are they are reacting to what they see and um, I just find it very fascinating I kind of love this I, I, I'm just so excited about all of this so um, let's go to the next one John Hino is somebody that I met during the uh, festival at Catalyst in Duluth Minnesota and the film commissioner said, well, you need to meet John Hino. He's a photographer, too, and he'll take you around Duluth, and you guys can shoot, and he'll teach you all about Duluth. And so we had uh, uh, what I call a photo adventure, which I love to do. Obviously, you know that with my friends. And John and I went out. Now, he is a specialist in the 3D style of imaging, in the, uh, sorry, in the HDR style of imaging. And this particular picture makes really good use of that. John's a very successful photographer. He sells a lot of his images as huge paintings that go on people's walls. And um, I think that would be kind of exciting to do. I aspire maybe to that. I don't know. Um, but I really admire it. And um, it was fun meeting him. So this is his picture. The window is a versatile compositional tool, giving a strong cue to look what's in the window. At the same time, the organizing strength of a window can be a weakness to the extent it reduces ambiguity and constrains the range of meanings a viewer brings to the table. Using a window challenges the creator to make the payoff for the viewer something more than an image unfettered by the frame. In this image called Leave Them Kids Alone, the multiple windows are basic compositional elements and make interesting art just with the diversity of textures and tones of the bricks and stones. So that's level one, textures and tones transformed by time and the elements. Now I circled this old building several times before I settled on this perspective with a small window to trees and sky on the other side. Uninterrupted stone and brick seemed too oppressive. The window to the trees offers a promise of something better beyond the walls. So that's level two. Walls as a metaphor for barriers of academia and convention as young minds try to preserve their original gifts of creativity and excitement for exploration. By the way, thank you, Pink Floyd, for the title Q. <laughs> I'm looking at that and I'm thinking that that is the style of that when we've seen three completely different styles. Um, Norman's, which was very emotional and very introspective, Lewis's that brought in the urban landscape and the people within it 
and you could almost build a story around those people and around the construction and you're wondering what's going to happen with that right and then now we have john who circled around this building several times until he found something that inspired him and those windows and his ability to take that photograph and using his talents with hdr paint it it's literally looks like a painting to me and and i think that work is very beautiful and one of the other reason I wanted to do this today is that I really want you guys to feel comfortable with your own visions. And we'll talk about that a little bit more too. So Ben Thwaites, we're going to take an about face and we're going to look at the work of somebody who is a photographer, who is the co-founder of Blue Fractal, which offers these immersive workshops around the world uh, and embodies it really embodies creativity and it brings people into remote locations and um and and then they they use photography and creativity as a way of um a way of interacting with those people i'm sorry my i'm trying to get my ipad going again so i can show you a few things but that's okay so he's a photographer he's also an educator he's also a phd and he has the left and the right side of the brain going really well and um, I'm gonna show you his picture which is again totally different and this picture is called let me find the note he wrote to me it's called hunting the surface and I'm gonna read to you what he said about it by the way this one was shot on a Canon 5d 4 with the Canon EF 18 to 15 millimeter lens and of course he's in the snorkeling gear underwater which is his first love is being underwater and I can sure sympathize with that he says here photographs create powerful windows into realities and stories that humans could not otherwise perceive this photograph is a single over underwater shot depicting a small mouth bass lying in wait eyes fixed upward as it hunts surface insects drifting in the rivers current to this fish that feeds largely on the surface the line between water and air, between over and under, is a blurry one. This fish lives in a reality that is not over or under, but rather over and under. This unusual photographic technique creates a window into this interesting, non-dualistic reality. I'm just enjoying the photograph for a minute. This is really beautiful work. Um, and Ben uh, has empowered a lot of people with his work. He, uh, he also counsels at-risk youth using photography and videography as a way for them to change their lives, to appreciate who they are as people. And the power of creativity, that reminds me so much of how powerful creativity is, right? All of these photographers open up their hearts and their minds and they're creative to us and that's what we do for other people too as creatives and I love that um, thank you uh, we're getting a comment about it being profound and beautiful I really really agree with you um, I'm, I'm just uh, so happy to share this with you and share my friends with you Andy Sweeney says love it beautiful and all-encompassing perspective it's pretty great hi Andy how are you <laughs> All right, this is another friend of mine who's an amazing woman. This is Gazina Thompson. She's a photographer, a filmmaker, a poet, and is mostly known throughout the world as a visionary architect. She has built some of the most famous structures and the famous environments around the world. Um, her TEDx talk changed thousands of lives. She was talking about how motherhood empowered her uh, creativity. And it's a wonderful talk. She's built performing arts centers around the world and worked on mega projects such as Buddhist monetary monasteries, global seed banks, skyscrapers and city designs in the United States, Europe, the Middle East, Africa, South Korea, China, Japan, and India in war zones and conflict areas. She's also a performer, a poet, and... Um, a painter I mean I don't know what Gazina doesn't do and do incredibly well and I'm so happy that we are in each other's lives and I've learned a lot from her 
and uh, we have taken a long voyage together over the years. And this is Gazina in her in South Africa, where she was raised. She's German um, by origin and spent many, many years in South Africa. So um, her work has a very, very poetic outlook on life. And I actually was moved by the picture that she sent in. So can you tell us why you shot that particular picture? What were you thinking when you shot it? I wasn't thinking anything. <laughs> I was just observing actually my environment. And of course, it was during the time when COVID was very raving and uh, we were all locked in, everyone. So I felt that spring was right around me and it knocked on the windows, literally. That's what I observed. And it showed to me very important uh, emotions that we were all looking for at that time desperately. And it was all unified in the reflection of this window. And this was rejuvenation, beauty, and hope. And it was combined exactly the Easter greeting that I wanted to send to my friends. So I shot it on my iPhone and, uh, and sent it to my friends as an Easter greeting. <laughs> I actually got that picture. And, and when I looked at it again, when Gazina sent it in for the Windows assignment, um, I really almost started to cry because you know, I don't know if you guys are the same way, but when I look at someone's art, I can really feel the heart behind it. I can feel the emotion behind it. Maybe I'm guessing, but I think that there's something there that we as artists, we have so much power when we communicate what's inside of us, what's in the nothing, what's in the void that we have discovered, and we communicate that to other people. We're going to find others like us who resonate along the same lines. And this picture with the ivy on the outside and the reflection of the beautiful, that the ivy to me represented COVID. And then I saw the beautiful blooms that were happening. And then the symbol of the cross built into the windows, which for her was very important too, because it was Easter. And um, I was very moved by it. So let's just take a minute and just look at it. You know, um, Gazina talked about not thinking too much. And, and so when I was talking with her and recording for, for this, she said something that I want to share with you, okay? For me, it is, I'm very instinctual. And uh, so my work is based on intuition. And for me, I, I was lucky because I, I, uh, I got an advice um, when I worked with one of the giants in the business related to, to camera work. And, and that was an amazing recommendation that I received from Clint Eastwood mm -hmm. because he gave me permission to go with my instincts when he he said to me don't overthink it mm -hmm. and that's really what suits me but i needed to get from someone that i admire uh, in outmost he gave me permission to follow you know just my my personal instincts don't overthink it Mm -hmm. So since then, I'm not overthinking it anymore. 
Oh, that's really good advice. And by the way, that's a picture that I took on the set of a movie that Gazina was directing, and that's Vilma Zygmunt, the very famous cinematographer who uh, painted with natural light. He always believed that natural light was was the best. And um, Gazina did have some comments about that, and I actually think we're going to talk about that at a later date. So stand by for that one. But, um, you know, I'm going to leave this up while I while I talk to you for a moment. How many times in your life have you been working on something, either as a photographer or a videographer, even as an actor, when somebody has said to you, stop, that's not going to work. That is not going to work. But you have that nothing. You have that void in your head and you can see what you want to do, right? So you do it anyway. And you know what? It works. So don't let people tell you not to do something that you can see. Don't let them tell you that it's not going to work. If you know it, it, it can. Um, nobody can see my vision. I mean, people sometimes think I'm nuts with the way I'm pointing my camera, and they don't know what I'm really seeing through the lens. So, you know, I, I travel through an unseen universe to them, and I'm not going to get derailed. I'm a little bit stubborn about that. About that. So um, I will reveal it at the right time and earlier today we were talking in the last panel about how Nick Carouse has been uh, you know taking a lot of pictures and but he hasn't shown them to people because he's busy doing his tutorials and I would say to Nick the same thing we told those those filmmakers the very first year of Sundance do you want to take something that means so much to you do you want to take that creativity and just put it in a closet don't you want to share that with other people? So, you know, photography for me demands me to see into another person's soul. And I'm going to keep going on this. Uh, and I'm going to show you my picture. And I'll explain to you uh, why I shot it and why this um, instinct thing is pretty important. So this is me doing what I love the most out in the middle of nowhere and the desert shooting pictures having fun I'm a photographer a cinematographer a filmmaker a radio host I live in San Diego California and I just love what I do so when I was thinking about this assignment for me I didn't quite know what to shoot and like I did with this talk it took a while for it to come and then when it came it came very strongly and this is what I shot And that's my granddaughter, and we were in my living room, and I thought, this is the seeing eye, and the assignment is a window. So I decided to shoot her looking at the window. I don't know if you can see it on whatever device you're using, but you can very clearly see a reflection of the window in her pupil. And that does several things for me. Um, you know, she's a teenager, and I love her dearly, and we get along very, very well, but I'm very curious about what's going to happen in her life. I'm very curious about what she sees creatively when she looks at the world. She's an incredibly creative person. And so this picture is actually one of the first shots on my new House of Blood digital, and because it's 100 megabytes, I could zoom in on her eye because I didn't have a macro lens that was taken with a 45 millimeter. I believe it's like a 2.4 or something like that. Um, and But I liked it. And what I wanted to do originally was combine it with a couple of other pictures that I saw, which would be showing the angle, showing what she was seeing. Like, in other words, something on the window, something from the window looking in at her. And I started to do all of that, and I realized... That's pretty darn complicated. And what was really most poignant was just my original thought. That original thing that came out of the void, that came out of nothing, was the image of her pupil reflecting the window. And, and that's what I ended up with. And so uh, I hope that those six pictures have a message to you. And that is, please just keep doing what you do because it is, it is just so important for you and for, for other people. And I'm going to stop sharing now, and we'll get back to, we'll get back to uh, 
talking to each other and please ask questions you can you can interrupt me or whatever i don't have my my uh my <laughs> i don't have my uh what do you call it the um uh the guide in front of me so i'm just going to talk to you and let's let's reminisce for a minute about about um how this journey for me has changed when we started sundance the whole scenery of sundance changed it went from a celebration to what is more like a market and a business and and so the reason i think that's pertinent with what we're talking about today is do we do this because we want the money do we do it because we just want to communicate and we love it um you know i i do it because i love it and i i don't always do it for the money most of the time i'm doing it for no money just because I love it so much. You know, I see people's heads nodding. We've, we've been there, right? So we just keep going. Um, there's a phrase, and I worked for many, many years in Hollywood. There's a phrase that says, um, nobody knows anything. But I believe that everybody knows everything that they're supposed to know at this point in their journey. Don't think about knowing everything for everybody. Think about knowing everything for you so wherever you are in your journey uh, that's where you're supposed to be and whatever you know or whatever you're learning at that moment in time is what you're supposed to do and where you're supposed to be okay so can we talk for a minute I almost hate to bring this up but I really think I have to what I call unsocial media there are millions and millions and millions of people who Ah, there are, you know, okay, so you're scrolling and you've got your phone and it's like the middle of the night or early in the morning and what do you do? You pick up your phone and we're addicted to those movies, right? So we're look, watching reels. But what happens is after a while, I've noticed that on Instagram, for example, it's the same song or the same type of quote or the same type of travel video or I love horses, so horses will come up. So, because the logarithm has decided at some point in my journey, my creative journey, that it knows what I want to see. But, you know, we get paid to appeal to the masses a lot now, right? If, you, if you're making reels or if you're making videos, you're told you have to appeal to the masses. But I think that mixing up of, how can I put this? Um, all of that paint that get mixed up together and delivered to you in one blob, it's gray. The colors are gone. The details are gone. So what you're seeing is this mixture of what AI wants you to see, right? We're constantly on our iPhone or our iPads or our laptops or our computers. And other people and the AI is now telling us what we're supposed to experience. And we're only experiencing the creativity that is being shown to us from a mechanism that may or may not be true to who we are as people, to not be true to who we are as human beings. So before long, we're only seeing one thread. And I talk about my life being a quilt of experiences, and I'm building this beautiful quilt with everything I've had throughout my life. But what's my quilt? What would it look like if all I had was one thread? right? I don't want just one thread. I want all kinds of threads. I want different types of threads and different colors. And I, and I want my quilt to be so wonderful that when I leave this earth, that's my legacy. You know, a joyous life well lived in this beautiful quilt. Um, our minds can't grow when we're being compartmentalized by IA, I mean by IA, by AI. Um, so maybe that's okay. But frankly, I hope not. I think scrolling, scrolling, scrolling is a terrible addiction, and I think that we need to get out there more and more. Um, I, it's It feels to me like it's almost like this beehive, right? And you see all of these drones flying around, and they're searching for the queen. And where's, where's the queen? Is it a viable queen? The reason there's so many drones is the queen is not reproducing. So um, I, I just think that in a way, AI is a viable, an unviable queen. And those bees are flying around. We're flying around trying to find uh, the brass ring, trying to find the creative nirvana. I don't think we're going to find it. So I just say stop looking and start living. Just start living.
observe, go live. And I don't mean <laughs> live as in streaming the way we're doing now. Just get out into the world and experiencing it literally or through music or dance or books or movies. Um, you know, let's not deal with the obvious, right? You have to study human nature. You have to celebrate humanity and you have to celebrate Mother Earth. I find my inspiration in nature and I'm sure all of you have different things that inspire you too. And the other thing that I've been thinking about um, is the question of to be or not to be. I think we should just stop questioning and start living. Um, you know, to borrow a phrase from John Lennon, just let it be. And I say to all of us, let's just sing very, very loudly into that void. Fill your hearts. Love is waiting in that open space between the knowing and the tangible. It's laying there in the intangible. And there's so much that you can discover there. There's so much beauty that you can discover there. So paint, draw, photograph, sing, dance, make movies. Um, because you can see something in that nothing um, that no one else can. Um, we each have the keys to our golden city. I have the keys to mine, and it's absolutely beautiful. You've got the keys, too. So where is that golden city? You know, I say to creatives, just be warriors. Do it loudly or do it silently, whatever suits you the best. It could be either one. And I tell everyone every time, get up off your chair and go do something absolutely wonderful today. Um, for me, when this is over, I say I'm going to celebrate nothing and I'm going to go out and paint.